Today's episode is brought to you by the Canby Foursquare Church. Since 1978, a place to grow, connect, and serve. Find out more at canbyfoursquare.com or on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. This episode is also brought to you by Odd Mo's Pizza in Canby. Handmade, awesome pizza as well as craft beer and cider delivered. Call them today at 503-266-8444. This tax exemption eludes me like a, a gazelle eludes an arthritic cat. Why can't Canby people keep track of their dogs? Like, what is... <laughs> <laughs> to do that, you can't be stupid with guns. Yeah. Is that the board is saying they want to make Canby schools great again? <laughs> it feels like we've been doing this interview for years. Just... Inside of me was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you run for school board, you win or you die. <laughs> There's no second place. <laughs> Welcome to the Canby Now Podcast. We are the best and easiest way to stay connected to what's happening in your hometown. I'm Tyler Frankie. I'm Joy Sturby. And I'm Tyler Clausen. The following statement was released to local media and law enforcement Friday from Heritage Specialty Foods. At approximately 8.30 a.m. this morning, there was a shooting at our Wilsonville facility. Law enforcement has responded and are on site. We now understand that one team member was fatally wounded and are working to understand more about what occurred. We are in active communication with law enforcement and will provide more information to our employees, partners, and customers as it becomes available. The news of this senseless violence comes as a shock to all of us. We ask for the community's prayers and support for survivors and all of our team members during this time, end quote. The incident, which is just as sad and senseless as they described, began when 25-year-old Camilo Santiago Santiago of Woodburn allegedly entered the specialty food store where he once worked on Southwest Boberg Road, then opened fire. He allegedly fired multiple rounds with a handgun, killing an employee later identified as the store's manager, 36-year-old Portland resident Carl Hellinger. The suspect then fled the scene in a red sedan, traveling southbound towards Woodburn. Santiago Santiago had recently been fired from Heritage Specialty Foods, police said. A Marion County Sheriff's Office deputy on patrol spotted the suspected vehicle and initiated a pursuit. The MSCO deputy was soon joined in the pursuit by personnel from multiple law enforcement agencies, including the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. The pursuit continued to Woodburn, coming to a stop on a dead end at Woodland Avenue and Seneca Creek Drive. A standoff began as Santiago Santiago barricaded himself in the red sedan. Clackamas County SWAT was training in Wilsonville that morning and quickly deployed to the scene, as did Marion County's SWAT team. Salem PD also deployed an armored vehicle to the standoff. In short order, armored vehicles from multiple agencies had surrounded and pinned in Santiago Santiago's vehicle. The standoff continued from approximately 8.50 to 9.30 a.m. At times during the standoff, Santiago Santiago yelled at the law enforcement to shoot him. Finally, Santiago Santiago exited the vehicle with his hands up and was immediately taken into custody by tactical team members. When Santiago Santiago was taken into custody, he had a pistol in his waistband. Authorities located two other firearms in the car. Santiago Santiago had been booked into Clackamas County Jail on charges of murder and felon in possession of a weapon. No bail has been set. Will the Canby School District bring a new bond proposal before voters in May 2020 primary election? It was the question the district's board of directors faced at a special meeting Thursday night. And their answer? Maybe. The board did not choose, definitively, to place a bond issue on the ballot for either the primary or general elections next year. However, they did direct Superintendent Trip Goodall and his staff to continue exploring the possibility, and to begin the community involvement part of the process. 
District Communications Coordinator Autumn Foster said a bond development advisory group composed of staff and community members will be appointed to help the district develop the proposed package. There is a whole menu of possible safety and technology upgrades, maintenance items, and other projects that could help improve Canby schools. But there's only so much money that would be available without raising current tax rates, something the district is adamant that they will not be asking for. What does or doesn't make the final cut will ultimately be up to the school board, but the recommendations from the advisory group will be critical to their decision. Foster said the district is in the process of setting up public meetings to gain further input from the community on what they would like to see in the bond. She said the meeting dates will be announced as soon as they are confirmed. A couple of important deadlines are also likely to weigh heavily on the board's decision. The end of 2020 presents a critical juncture as the current bond, which voters passed to build Baker Prairie Middle School 15 years ago, expires at the end of the year. In next year's primary, or the general election, the board could propose the new bond as an extension of the current rate. After that, the bond would represent a true tax increase, which the district's consultants and common sense say would be a much harder sell. There is also one major factor favoring the primary over the general. If the district successfully passes a new bond proposal in the May 2020 election, it would also be eligible to claim an additional $4.8 million in grant funds from the Oregon Office of School Facilities. That funding would not be available if the board chooses to wait until November or if the bond fails in the May primary. Foster said the board will decide in February whether the proposed bond package aligns with the district's goals and should be referred to voters. The deadline to file for the primary is February 28th. Just Call It The Real World Can Be Fire Edition. A new modular home has been installed at the site of the district's planned Northside Station on North Redwood Street, next to the city maintenance shop and wastewater treatment plant. The house will serve as a base of operations while remodeling work is underway at the district's main station on South Pine. The remodel is being funded by the 4.9 million bond measure district voters passed last November. Canby Fire Chief Jim Davis gave the update before the Canby City Council at their last meeting. We do have a modular sitting at the main fire station. Our hopes is that uh, we'll begin construction of the remodel of the main station uh, February 1st. And so we'll be busy kind of moving and trying to figure out where everybody's going to be. We're in the final <coughs> phase of design and um, development of the documents to put it out to bid. We have a, awarded a contract to uh, Emmerich Construction uh, to actually do the remodel of that fire station. A permanent north side station is also in the works. Chief Davis said the fire district will be working on geoengineering and site development simultaneous with the main station remodel. The district hopes to begin construction on the Northside project in early summer 2020. The Northside station was a critical part of the bond package voters approved. It's targeted at one of the biggest challenges to providing timely medical, fire and other emergency services in Canby. The railroad that divides our city neatly in two. Highway 99E is also a challenge, but sirens and flashing lights can clear the way of passing motorists. But that's not an option if a train is barreling down the tracks. The new Northside Station will help address this by giving the district a base of operation on either side of the tracks. CFD Northside will be used primarily for medical response, which accounts for roughly 70% of the district's calls anyway but could be expanded to a full fire station if further growth necessitates it. Chief Davis said the district is also looking at new ways to improve efficiency and strengthen partnerships with other community fire agencies. The district already handles administrative duties through an intergovernmental agreement with neighboring Aurora Fire District and is planning to enter into a similar IGA with Woodburn. 
Canby Fire has also hired consultants to help them find other ways to improve efficiency and eliminate redundancies. We've hired uh, special districts of Oregon to actually uh, perform a, a study uh, between uh, Malala, Canby, Woodburn, and Aurora to look at what's our next efficiency that we look at uh, that makes sense. And those will be presented to a joint fire board meeting in which uh, they'll receive that report. Um, we hope that that will happen sometime in December or January, the results of that particular study. So, uh, the, but the cooperation is, is tremendous uh, between the fire districts and we're working very closely. Chief Davis said he expects the results of that study to be presented to a joint meeting of the various fire district leadership in December or January. We're in a really tough league. It's been said so often of Canby football the past few years that it's practically become our unofficial motto. But it's true. The Three Rivers League is brutal. Three of the top five teams in the state were in our league this year. Number five, West Lynn. Number three, Lake Oswego. And number one, Tigard, who went undefeated in 6A this year, 9-0. A fourth team, Tualatin, was ranked seventh. In fact, every team in our league made the playoffs this year, besides Camby. And half of the eight teams playing in the quarterfinals this week are Three Rivers League as well. There are many reasons the Camby Cougars football team has won only four games in 27 contests over the past three years. But one major factor is certainly the brutally competitive TRL as well as the general difficulty of playing at 6A, the top class for the state's largest schools. The Cougs now have a chance to reshuffle their fate as the OSAA, Oregon School Activities Association, has offered the opportunity to move down to 5A for the 2020 season. Head coach Jimmy Joyce said the unexpected offer was made to the Cougars and a handful of other teams whose winning percentages has been under 22% the past two years. Canby is also the third smallest school in 6A sports. We didn't expect this, so we've just been doing our best to find out all the information, Joyce said. We just want to be transparent, communicate all the facts, but above all, do what's best for these student athletes. The team is holding a meeting at 6 p.m. Wednesday, November 20th at the Richard R. Brown Fine Arts Center to share information and hear from the community. If the school does decide to drop classifications, the current 5A leagues would be redrawn and it's not exactly certain where Canby would land. However, Coach Joyce said it's likely we would be in a league with nearby Wilsonville. A decision must be made by December 1st. Canby would automatically move back to 6A after two years if the Cougs won more than two-thirds of their game or a single playoff contest. Canby's new softball coach for the 2020 spring season is not exactly new to Canby Athletics. Ty Craft was a three-sport athlete all four years at Canby High School, class of 1990. The nine-time varsity letterman was an all-league in basketball and baseball and earned 1989 all-state honors as a tight end, linebacker, and place kicker for the Canby Cougars football team. He went on to play two years of football at Oregon State. He graduated in 94 and returned to the area to start his own business, Craft Screens. That's Craft with a K, but not like the mac and cheese. Before long, he was back in the athletic scene as a coach. He helped organize the Canby Rebels club teams and served as softball head coach for four years, winning three state championships from 2016 to 2018. In total, he's been involved in coaching youth and high school athletics for 24 years in football, basketball, baseball, and softball, and has also served on the Canby School Board. My coaching philosophy is program first, team second, and player third, 
Lovecraft explains, We want to create an environment where the girls not only become great softball players, but great students and community leaders. He thinks one of the greatest assets that will serve him in his new position is the relationships he's already formed with many of the players, having already developed plans for their growth and development as athletes. He believes his biggest challenge will be managing expectations. We have a lot of players who can play the game of softball at a high level, he says. It's a great problem to have, but can create challenges for sure. He says he's most excited about helping create an environment where the girls have fun, feel a part of something bigger than themselves, and love the sport of softball. For those interested in participating in softball next year, there will be a parent player meeting at 6 p.m. December 9th in Room 1 at Canby High School. It will include introductions from Kraft and the other coaching staff, information about winter workouts, which will begin the week of January 6th, as well as a discussion of program philosophy, expectations, and communication. Hey, Tyler. Yeah? Can you do me a favor? Just real quick. Name all the services that you're subscribed to. Okay. Um, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. There's like Google stuff, I think. Uh, my wife, I think, does a cat thing. And I'm looking into Dollar Shave Club. It's starting to get a little ridiculous, right? There's even an app to manage all of your subscriptions now. Of course, it comes with its own monthly convenience fee. It can get a little overwhelming. They've even coined a term for it, subscription fatigue. If you're being hit with subscription fatigue blues, we have a solution for you, at least when it comes to streaming options. Try Easy Video TV from Direct Link. It offers your favorite shows and movies all in one app on the same bill as your internet service. Direct Link is a local community-based provider that has your back. Record your favorite shows, watch them anywhere, and access all the major local and cable TV networks with an Easy Video subscription. Why are we still sitting here? How do I sign up? Let's go! <laughs> well, it's easy. Just call DirectLink at 503-266-8111, visit their office at Juniper and 2nd, or go to directlink.coop to switch to Easy Video TV today. Hey Tyler, did you know that the world has changed in the past 20 years? No way! Yep, it's true. The way people shop for goods and services has completely changed since this thing called the internet started catching on. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it. And yet some realtors still offer the same old services in the same old ways and for the same old percentages. Victory Point Property Group in Canby believes it's time the real estate business caught up with the times. They'll meet with you for free, explain every step of the process, give you a clear game plan, and even let you choose the listing commission. Really? They they let you choose their commission? Really? Victory Point Property Group understands this is one of the biggest and most exciting decisions of your life, and they'll do everything they can to make sure you handle it like a rock star. Wow, that sounds great. I'm going to check them out by calling 503-263-4700 or by visiting online at victorypointhomes.com. You do that. Victory Point Property Group. Real estate reimagined. Cool. So my guest on the Cami Conversation today is someone that you may or may not know, but I can almost guarantee you that you are familiar with at least one of her works. It's artist Kathy Ray Smith. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Frankie. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for being on the Cami Now podcast. My pleasure. And thank you so much for the honor of being asked. Absolutely. We are honored to have you on. Um, in addition to being an artist, you are one of the eight or so founding members and the current president of Canby Area Beautification. Correct. And the artwork that I was referencing is, of course, a beautiful mural. I believe it's called The Joy of Discovery. That's on... The Magic of Discovery. The Magic of Discovery. But the Joy of Discovery works. I would have called it The Joy, <laughs> but that's okay. We won't we won't quibble. Um, but that is on the uh, very, very large mural that's on the wall outside of our Canby Public Library. Yeah, it's 15 feet tall and 45 feet long. Good so grief. certainly the largest campus I've ever <laughs> <laughs> worked with. Yeah, so it was, uh, let's talk about it. It was made out of metal. Do you Correct. often do uh, metal work, or was that your first foray into that? Well, um, I like eclectic materials. Okay. And so 
the um, the actual initial request for or call for artists for that piece, they were looking for three specific panels, fifteen feet by fifteen feet, uh-huh. and I just wrote in response. And said, well, why don't you take the 45 feet and use that as a nice expansive visual? Oh, they were looking for three separate pieces. And I said, you know, you run the the risk of there may be very disparate pieces that are perhaps not in harmonious coexistence. And so then I was invited, well, we'd love to see you submit a concept. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Also, you didn't want some like middling artist, you know, infringing on your work. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Exactly. Who wants that tacky thing over there? Right, (laughs) yeah. This needs to be just my... No, I'm just kidding. But... And there were certain challenges to it. It had a uh, real limited weight... Mm. Uh, oh, sure. Capacity to it. Yeah. And so originally I was thinking of materials that could stand the test of time out in the elements. Mm. And obviously metal rapidly comes to mind. Right. But... Um, Originally, I was thinking of just some solid metal, and it would have been too heavy. Mm. And so I um, actually worked with two of the local. So when you companies. say solid metal, you meant it would have some like, depth to it. It wouldn't exactly. have been, yeah, some well, so flat. There's there's depth, but it's very, <laughs> very thin depth. Um, yeah. So rather than a mural where it's actually painted to the wall, it is, a, quote unquote, sculpture in that it is. A piece of metal that has been applied, right. but it's single dimensional because there was the concern of uh, the sidewalk right there. Mm. You don't want any passersby to get injured, yeah, be impaled or something like that. Right, right. Or and use it as a climbing surface to get onto the roof of the library. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so um, I actually approached two local companies to work with me on this in um, producing and supplying materials. Yeah. And they were the um, Hot Rod DreamWorks. Oh, of they course. applied there's actual um, automotive paint yeah. on the black silhouetted portion of it. And then I had t- discussed with him various materials, and I said, you know, I need to be within this weight limitation. And then he suggested that I talk to Canby Signs and Graphics. Sure. Yeah. And they had a. Um, a material that was, I believe it's an aluminum exterior that sandwiches like a PVC polymer or something. Mm. So it's really quite lightweight yeah. and pretty resilient. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Can be signs and graphics are awesome. They, like, I feel like I, I talk to them sometimes and I feel like I'm talking to, like, a, you know, someone that speaks a different language. Like, you know, so, yeah. like... They're all kinds so, of polymers and materials yeah. and things, and it's just They're like... They're so helpful, so yeah, great. Yeah. And um, we, <laughs> with the Canby Area Beautification, we give out an award annually for the Business yeah. Beautification Award. Right. And this last year, we went to Canby Signs and Graphics to create the plaque. Mm. Um, and we gave a um, an appreciation award to the outgoing city commissioner, um, Rick Robert Robinson. Yeah. And yeah. then city um, administrator. Yeah. Yeah. And then um what did I say? Did I say a city commissioner? Oh yeah. that's the comic books. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were looking at a Commissioner Gordon up there exactly. on Batman, yeah. And then um <laughs> also the the Canby Chapel right. Pioneer Chapel yeah. um performing arts was the recipient this year. Very and, well deserved. And, Yes, yeah. such delightful yeah. people, and they've done such a fantastic job with that. Yes. Inside and out, it's just beautiful. Yeah, totally agree. But they uh, produced some really beautiful plaques for us hmm. and um, did a great job and were able to kind of turn it around almost overnight. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the magic of discovery, let's talk a little bit about the design. Because, okay. um, I mean, I, I love the the work by the way like oh, thank you it's uh, it it actually um you know uh, when i first moved here like it's what enticed me to go into that library like it oh thank w- you without That's it great. that building is so boring you know what i mean yeah. like in it's just i mean it's obviously like very well designed and everything and it's a wonderful inside um but on the outside like that to me really does is what makes it the library is that mural, you know, and it oh, is thanks. right there by the door. So it really does entice you in. Um, but where did the inspiration, you know, for the, the magic of inspiration? The first um, 
aspect of the concept that came to mind readily is I thought we've got 45 feet mm. and let's take a beautiful oak tree and span the entire 45 feet. So mm. that was the first thing that came to me. And then, of course, you know, integrating people into the scene yeah. and um, the elements kind of were a secondary okay. idea because I was thinking about the inspiration of creativity, mm. you know, whether it's writing or music or or painting, whatever it may, whatever form it may take. Yeah. And I thought when I did my graduate degree, I often said I wish I could have gotten um, mileage plus miles for all of the hours <laughs> I spent in the library doing research and things. And so... Um, I just think it's... You'd be a platinum member. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I'd be able to go on world trips <laughs> yeah, all the time. Yeah, go into the library lounge that only the exclusive yeah, members yeah, get. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> but I just thought it is one of the wonderful, wonderful resources that's available to us mm-hmm. here in this country. And um, then I thought, as a child, I mean, obviously, if you've got art in you, it's something that manifests itself almost from day one. Yeah. And um, I thought, well... I'd love to incorporate an aspect of the community and inspire the children like I've been inspired. Because, I mean, through either writing or art, as a kid, I won a bicycle and, you know, Mm. jingle competitions. And I won family turkeys and hams and things from coloring competitions and things. And I thought I'd love to include the children of the community. So I went in and I talked to the uh, director of the library and Irene Green and she kindly agreed to work with me to where we put out materials for the children of the community and welcome yeah. them for I think it was the month of August and they collected the drawings for me and then I looked through them and I was so excited to see so many so so this what you're describing now is maybe one of my favorite parts of the piece so m- most of what you decided we talked about like the um, the metal material that's like mm-hmm. the the basis of the piece and it's this you know black metal that stands out really well against the underlying wall of the library um, but then and interspersed throughout it are these small, like very colorful pieces. And are, is it paper that the kids no, originally no, designed it on? How, what's it? Well, the the children drew on paper. Okay. And um, then Canby Signs and Graphics gotcha. were able to take that and actually print that image onto okay. the aluminum sandwiched polymer okay. piece. Cool. And but then, there's, they're like rainbows and mm-hmm. clouds and birds and, and what, animals and what you see are the colors that the children actually provided. Mm. So. They they are their creations, and I wanted colorful pieces. I had asked yeah. that they be colorful because I knew I wanted to silhouette the figures in the landscape because I wanted it to be something that you could look at it and see yourself in it. Because yeah. to me, it's an homage to our community, to yeah. Camby. Right. And um, I thought with the colorful um, pieces, I wanted them to be sort of like elements of, of magic where yeah. it's the the colorful inspiration that comes to life through the reading or you see it comes out of the saxophone and yeah. so it's the music it's the well, writing I, everything I do see myself in it because there, there's that boy by the oak tree which you mentioned and mm-hmm. he's reading a book um, and then at least the um, the colorful pieces from the kids are uh, kind of scattered all throughout but there's at least one stream that seems to be coming like from the book that the exactly. kid is reading um, each open book has a stream coming from it oh, and then okay, around the gazebo there is a saxophone player oh, and people yeah. are kind of gathering and dancing and the music's also coming out of the instrument yeah yeah or you know emanating from it i guess you could say yeah but it does take me back to my years as a uh you know last key kid in the summer you know and the, like all i could really do is walk down to the library and get some <laughs> books you know um and for better or worse i think a lot of the person i turned out to be i can draw back to you know things i read and things that i just fell in love books i fell in love with you know during those years so it's well it's such a wonderful resource again because it opens up the world to you yeah it can take you beyond what your environment, your immediate environment can introduce. Yeah. And I love because there are limitless careers you can pursue. I was at the Oregon Coast last week, 
and went to the um, Smoke Jumpers Museum, yeah, which was fascinating. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, the guide who had been a smoke jumper, he huh. was just great. Yeah, he was and talking they, for about for folks that don't know, these are folks, people that are especially trained firefighters that jump right. out of helicopters into airplanes, right? Into I should the, say yeah. parachute out of helicopters, exactly, but um, into uh, often raging forest fires to because there's no other way to get there. Exactly, and they. They have to have all of the equipment on them so that if there's no clearing and they're snagged up in trees, they have yeah. to repel down or whatever the proper term is. Yeah. Go fight the fire, climb back up the tree, unsnare everything, and then hike out, you know, 60 miles or whatever it may be. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. But anyway, the point that I was making, because <laughs> I can go off on tangents instantaneously, but the point I was making is that he was talking about the fact that among the very tight-knit crew of, of firefighters, one of them became an astronaut and was one of the first to go to the moon. Um, wow. There was also one guy who was, um, he defied all odds. He was able to do what he did by congressional appointment because he was, I believe, like four foot eleven, uh-huh. and he couldn't meet the qualifications by the standards uh-huh. And yet he, I think they said he weighed like, I don't know, we'll just take a number, 150 pounds. Yeah. And he was able to um, wear a pack that was closer to 200 pounds mm. and do everything and anything that anyone else could do. And so I just thought, this is not anything that I've experienced firsthand, but yet you can go into a library and you can read about being an astronaut. Mm. You can read about... Um, you know, history or something projecting into the future. Or, yeah. I mean, it's it's just a fantastic resource and opportunity. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, uh, it absolutely is. I, I agree with you in the way that it does um, open up the 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 world that we live in to people right here in Canby, Oregon, and as well as you know all of the amazing experiences of history. So yes. Um, Another way that uh, you and uh, some of your fellow founding mem- members of uh, Canby Area Beautification, which we also call CAB, mm-hmm. are helping to improve our community is, is through CAB. Let's talk a little bit about where that came from. You're coming up on a year here. Yes. Um, and basically, my understanding is the idea is to, that uh, it, it sprang from Canby's nickname, The Garden Spot. Mm-hmm. And the fact that exactly. in some places we definitely weren't living up to that, and uh, some folks got it in their minds that they wanted to change that. Is that pretty accurate? Or that's that's hitting <laughs> the nail on the head. Uh, that was one of the things that I thought is, you know, we've got such a charming community, but the introduction for many people is the main thoroughfare of Highway 99E. Yeah. And so that was our first target. It's actually something we've been working on. Those of us that are now officially formed as CAB um, started working on about three years ago. Mm-hmm. And we've been paint, um, planting knock out rose bushes because mm-hmm. they're supposed to be fairly resilient yeah. to, and drought resistant and um, I think that you know once they get established if someone had to pull off the side of the road they could drive right over the top of them so yeah. it doesn't impede anything but I just thought if we had banks of color and mm. um, some foliage as opposed to kind of uh, broken down buildings yeah and, and free growing <laughs> weeds that yeah. are either uh, cut down or you know uh, knee length yeah I just thought if we could um, live up to our name the garden spot mm. with um, some landscaping and things that would really add and we are a nonprofit organization of 501c3 mm. and so we're doing things in- Incrementally, And I remember someone once made a comment and they said, oh, it's overwhelming. You can never do all of that. And I thought about this uh, kind of comical adage of, well, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. So we've been approaching it incrementally. And I don't know when you air your podcast, but if anybody hears this before this year, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, mm. um, November 23rd at 10 a.m., we're gathering and the firefighters for year three now are joining us to to um, 
do the planting. Yeah, the and big planting. Yeah, yeah, we're welcoming everybody and anybody in the community. Just show up. We're starting at 10 a.m. and bring mm. your shovel. Cool, cool. Um, and so where will that be? It's going to be on Highway 99E right across from Canby Builder Supply and, okay. and Miller's. And in fact, those two companies very kindly donated the funds for us to buy the um, knockout roses that are going to be planted there. Yeah. Yeah. So we have... 100 rose bushes we're going to be putting in. And then also Wooden Shoe Tulip Farm has, for the past three years, donated spring blooming bulbs to us. Oh, cool. Which has been fantastic. And so um, we're working with Mallory at um, the Gwen's Coffee Shop. He formerly was the director of the... Um, Chamber of Commerce. Right. And when we had started, he was still with the Chamber of Commerce and he knows the owners quite well. And mm. so has been able, he's been instrumental in having that donation facilitated cool. each year. So we're, I mean, to be again. fair, Mallory knows everybody quite well, well that's true. in the universe. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, no, I love it. It's so cool um, because I, I'm not uh, a huge flower person myself. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't tell like a tulip from a you know other flower but uh <laughs> can't even think of one right now but um i do notice and i've started to notice a lot especially spending more time in downtown canby um how the the little accents of flower boxes and things that i personally wouldn't even have necessarily noticed like i don't you know zoom in like oh that's a beautiful pink whatever you know right. um but just the way that they sort of uh accent things and and um i think at least for me like really impact your mood and your feel of a place um without yes. necessarily being the focal point um and i think that that uh, it is as you guys continue one bite at a time i think that that is going to have a huge impact on 99 because it's not something where you know, before you guys started planting, it's not something where you'd be driving down 99E and you would think, you know what this really needs is some flowers. Like, that's not a thought you would have. But when there are flowers and there are growing things, I think that, again, you won't necessarily maybe even attribute it to the plants, but you're going to feel better, I think, on that road just from the impact that, that uh, beautiful growing things have on people. Well, and that's exactly right. It's not something that's meant to call out and say, hey, stop traffic and look right, at me. Right. But it's something, it's kind of like, I remember I once was walking down the street and there was a house with a big picture window and there wasn't a single piece of artwork on their walls. They mm. were just blank white walls with a sofa and it looked like someone was just moving in, but yet yeah. it had been that way for a couple of years. Yeah. And I thought... It may not be something that you consciously think about, yeah. gee, let me put this on the wall or that on the wall, right. but it makes a huge difference as to the environment. And I remember hearing, I can't remember who the quote was from, but someone had said, let your environment uh, be a voice for you. It should be an extension of who you are. And I thought, there's, there's no reason that we can't live in beauty. Hmm. And it's... It doesn't have to be something that's tangible and calling attention. It's just something that creates a different atmosphere. Years ago, I was working in an advertising agency for a lot of years, and I had a national client. And I remember I had some clients that came out from the East. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the comments that they made over and over again is, wow, it's so beautiful here yeah. in Oregon. Look at all of the trees. Look at all of the trees. And when I was at the coast last week, one of the things that I marveled at is, look at this beautiful coastline. And there are places where you can look right through the forest out onto the ocean. And yeah. I just thought, this is so spectacular. Yeah. And I feel like let's create beauty wherever we can and let's help nurture and facilitate it yeah. in every way possible because it does make a difference it does make a difference to you know feel good like if you pull like the Oregon coast looking through the forest mm. there's just a calm and an ease and yeah. I don't know it's a source of inspiration I think yeah, yeah. and it uh, helps bring the uh, blood pressure down. Yeah, yeah. I love what you said, Kathy, that, you know, there's no reason to not live in beauty because I think that, you know, and not to take away from the the hard work, I, you know, the many, many volunteer hours that you and the rest of the folks at CAB have done, um, you know, just in the raw planning, not to mention, you know, securing the sponsorships and getting this and that to, to happen. Um, but at the same time, um, 
it's not i mean it's easier than you think like a lot of times it's it's um that's i think just like a superpower that people that humans have is the ability to just with a little time a little attention you know to take something from just being boring and drab to to being beautiful you know it often is not it's certainly not impossible and often not as hard as you might think so well i always feel where there's a will there's a way yeah and i think i mean look at what mankind has been able to do over the ages yeah. some phenomenal things yeah. and i mean just the notion going back to the astronaut yeah. uh, the notion of traveling that distance and then walking on another planet or a moon whatever yeah. it may be is phenomenal sure. and the, I remember someone was talking about Galileo I think it was had determined that instead of the um, the earth. sun revolving around the earth right. the earth and other planets revolve around the sun right. I mean that was centuries ago how in the heck was he able to do that yeah. so if you look at some of the phenomenal achievements of mankind and then you think about the task at hand yes it's a lot of work but I just feel that to a large degree my role is to believe that it can occur and then facilitate it because I see it as something and in fact I invite people in the community because I want it to be something where you can feel that you're a part of that mm -hmm. and I'd love to see it go multi-generational so that you know a generation from now someone can show their child or their grandchild and say hey you know dad planted that yeah. 50 years ago and look at how pretty that is yeah. or something i feel like let's have a hand in creating beauty and right. you know making wherever you are the best that it can be right right i'm such a terrible gardener for me it'd be you know dad planted this and then it died and then somebody <laughs> much more competent planted this and it's still alive but anyway uh, i think that's a great place to lead this conversation just with that legacy that you and the other folks at cab are going to have through this work and also f the legacy that you have at the where we started with the uh, wonderful mural at the oh, library um i think that that's really cool to have uh, made your mark in uh, two different but really beautiful ways in our community. Um, if folks do have questions about CAB or want to join in, um, is there a contact uh, that we can direct them to before yeah, you go? We have a Facebook page, Canby Area Beautification, okay. and you can reach out to us there. You can also reach me directly. Um, my name is Kathy Ray Smith. It's C A T H Y R A E S M I T H. And my I don't know if you had to spell Smith, but okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, my email. Email is just my full name, Kathy Ray Smith at gmail.com. So cool. pretty easy to reach me. Or you can track down Frankie and have him get in touch I'll, with me. I'll, yeah, I'll share your personal phone number and just say, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, there we go. Just <laughs> spread it out Anything there. that they need. Um, see, I'd like to take a moment, though, and say thank you so, so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And yeah. congratulations to you for this lovely achievement of uh, now a year and a couple months. Thank you so much. We, uh, I'm just looking. We need some flowers in here, don't we? Uh, yeah. That can be done. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks, Kathy. True story. When we first started the Can Be Now podcast, we were looking to buy some stickers. Just something to help us get our name out there. We didn't have a lot of money, so we tried to do everything as cheaply as possible online. We wound up with a thousand of these teeny tiny cheap looking stickers. Not exactly the impressive swag we were hoping for, but you know, you get what you pay for. Yes, you do. If we had been smart, we would have gone to see Carrie at Promotional Strategies. She's a real life human and a creative <laughs> genius who would deliver practical, strategic ways to promote your business on any budget if you're looking for high quality swag that you can be proud to see your logo on promotional strategies is where you want to go find them at 695 southeast first avenue in canby or online at ps266swag.com the great outdoors sometimes you just got to get away to a place where life is simpler the air is clean and the nearest ringing phone is about a million miles away one of the best places that we found is My Cowboy Cabin near Joseph, Oregon, in the heart of the Eagle Cap Wilderness. Eagle Cap is the largest unspoiled wilderness area in Oregon, with breathtaking views of granite mountains and crystal clear lakes, and more than 500 miles of trails to explore. It's one of the premier hiking, fishing, and hunting destinations in the Pacific Northwest. My Cowboy Cabin is open from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend, and can be reserved on a weekly or monthly basis, depending on availability. With a cabin that sleeps up to eight people, and also a teepee that sleeps eight or more, <laughs> 
<laughs> That's right. It's perfect for family vacations, retreats, reunions, and more. Find out more at mycowboycabin.com. Joining us on the line now is Mindy Montecuco. She is the chair of the Canby Bike and Pedestrian Citizen Advisory Committee. And we're going to be talking about what's known as the Art Park or the, the new community bike hub, hub, basically, at the corner of Holly and Territorial across from the Methodist Church. If you have drive by there, or notice there's kind of some work going on, so we're going to be discussing that. Hi, Mindy. Hi, I'm happy to be joining you today, Tyler. Absolutely. Thanks for being on the show. And thank you so much for all your work that you and the committee do and helping keep folks safe and just keep uh, keep things moving in, in terms of not cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and right. Thank you so much. And we do want to make sure that uh, we keep it comfortable for those in cars, too. So, oh, sure. you know, it's always good to have a good, safe interface between yeah. all pedestrians and bikes and right. um, cars. Yeah, absolutely. Just keep keep everything nice and cordial between all those. Exactly. Because <laughs> often there's overlap, right? You know, pedestrians <laughs> will be driving or whatever, so it's not like yes. groups. But yeah, so what's going on over at the, the art park, which um, I do often hear people call it the, the bike hub, but I guess it is yes. officially known as the art park. So, yes, it was, it's originally... And, and still is the art park and the Canby Livability Coalition really came together to create that park. And um, then a few years ago, uh, we approached them uh, in recognizing that a bike hub would be a wonderful asset to the park there, particularly because anyone who lives on that side of town is pretty familiar with bikes parked or, or stopped at that intersection looking at their gps or their maps trying to figure out what direction to go from that intersection hmm. so it really is kind of a crossroads for um people touring through the north willamette valley um, because that intersection is obviously people coming off the ferry they cross that it was just an obvious area that could really use a bike hub and and this way to hopefully draw people into Canby, uh, not to just bypass it or to come back and visit for some of our great events, mm. the event center and all our activities and everything. So, yeah, it just seemed like a natural fit. Yeah, absolutely. So and that was put in in uh, 2017. Yes, and that's right. From what and I hear is very, very well used. Um, I think that a lot of people that that do cycle in our area are very appreciative of, of it and have been using it. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, for our, our our own community members and for those um, touring through, yeah. it really serves everyone. And um, we also have a lot of um, information about area lodging, restaurants events and then also um we have bike maps there i was just over there i do need to replenish them i realized uh -huh. so i did put some more out anyhow and um and also uh one of the next things we need to do is apply for a grant to get some more permanent signage in there that'll uh hold up through the weather but um yeah. you know we'd like to put links up or how to connect with Ride with GPS, where we do have um, those same rides that we have in print on Ride with GPS, which is also what Travel Oregon uses for um, tourism, uh, directs them to Ride with GPS. Cool. And we are ride ambassadors really with cool. Ride with GPS. Well, my yeah. understanding is there's something new coming to the Bike Hub that'll also be pretty appreciative. Um, and that's what the work that's going on now is about? Exactly. And they are putting in a bottle filler with a drinking fountain. And also the Canby Livability Coalition has been really trying to take the next step with that park, but they have to get irrigation mm -hmm. going there. And so that's what this grant was about. And it was a community partnership 
program grant through Mount Hood Territories Tourism. And so, yes, I mean, really, the Canby Livability Coalition has been the ones to really make all this happen um, through the grant writing process. So, you know, we just provide some suggestions and it's been a great partnership. That's awesome. So yes. There's, so there's going to be, um, yeah, this lovely new like water fountain slash bottle fish filler. I'm sure a lot of the cyclists and pedestrians and folks are going to be appreciating that. But also part it's, of it is putting in irrigation so they can kind of up the landscaping game. Is that the idea? Absolutely. And and there's also wayfinding signage that was included with that, too, so oh, that cool. we can direct people into Canby and right. around and all that. So, right, yeah, all the highlights. Here's where, you know, Fred Meyer is. Here's where City Hall is. Here's Game Now Podcast. All the things that people want to check out. So, Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know what? I am not – I'm not quite sure – what if that really pointing to well i know that some of the wayfinding signage is to direct them towards the bike hub but oh, okay. also to other things in can be and i know that through another uh tourism grant that i i'm not sure if i'm totally correct on this but there's been wayfinding signage that Calvin Lasura has been a big part of getting going um, to direct people around town cool. to, Economic yes, part of our tourism plan, which has been, I think, a great thing. Yeah. So, yes, it kind of goes along with that, the wayfinding signage uh, regarding the bike hub. Well, what else is going on with uh, Bike and Ped, Mindy? I know that um, you guys have been uh, doing quite a bit of work in recent months on possibly a, a new trail. Yes, that's right. And uh, we just um, received donation in December 2017, so we're coming up on two years. Uh, we received from uh, Bob Traverso and Nancy Traverso mm -hmm. uh about 80 acres, 81 acres uh, of new parkland that um, really doubles the length of the existing logging road yeah. trail. Yeah, it's so exciting. It goes, it connects all the way out to Maxburg Road. So it's an incredible, incredibly generous donation, and we're so excited about it. Um, I mean, come on, the Traverso Trail, like that is like something I know. out of a Tolkien, like that is awesome. Don't you think? Yeah, oh, I, I, I absolutely. Yeah. And that that logging road has been so heavily compacted with those overweight logging vehicles all mm -hmm. these years mm -hmm. that that roadbed is solid. Now, right. granted, portion of that Traverso Trail. Uh, the new donation, uh, some of that has been washed out. The old logging bridge that crosses the Malala still stands, but the approaches have washed out. I don't know that the bridge is safe enough to accommodate anything. Gotcha. But what the bike ped uh, committee has recently applied for a development grant through Mount Hood Territories, the tourism branch of Clackamas County. Uh -huh. And, um, so we've applied for a this development grant to um, analyze what it would take to get this new section up and running and what other uh, possible connections could be made. Really, with this new donation, it gets us as far as two-thirds of the way to Malala. Wow, really only, awesome. yeah, it, it leaves us about four miles from Malala. Cool. It's really exciting. Cool. That is really exciting. That that sounds great. And, you know, I do, I think I know what you're talking about because I remember back in September, there was an invitation from the Bike and Pet Committee to, I think, some city councilors and a few other folks in the community to walk that trail and just kind of, you know, for our city leaders to have a chance to sort of see what we were all talking about as far as this project goes. And I do yes. remember an advisory being in that, that there is a section where you are in water, I think, up, at, up to your ankles at that point. So. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. And yeah. it, it was a, 
a fun couple hikes out there. But in doing this, you know, any time that you have a trail, things like this, the neighboring adjacent property owners are going to have concerns. And we want to make sure that it is safe for them. It's safe for our community members. And, you know, there's a lot of questions to be answered. And so that's part of what this development grant would really take a look at it would to really put things into action, create trailheads. And we have a whole list of um, points, the factors that would really have to be considered before anything was done. But yeah. we really have a great opportunity to create a, a wonderful tourism asset and destination. And I have to say, we received the most awesome letter of support from the um, Lamette Falls and Land Heritage area. Mm -hmm. uh, they really recognize how having this uh, logging road trail, the Malala Forest Road mm -hmm. Trail, mm -hmm. um, would be such an asset to the whole heritage area. Um, so we're very excited to be a part of that. And it would really, it's an opportunity as much as we say here in Canby that we love having our small town. Yeah. <laughs> if we could build up our tourism aspect, it's a great way to get, have people visit and maybe not stay right. yeah. <laughs> so, to, to find the words of our uh, former governor, Tom McCall. Um, but right. anyhow, I think it has something for everyone. And it's also a great opportunity to get bikes uh, in the area, but staying off the roads, you know, sure. it's always, everyone's Safer. always happier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when That's they can. Great. Well, I, I think it's just awesome because, you know, and I think that we're going to be seeing and hearing a lot more about this kind of stuff because here in Canby, we have such amazing natural resources, you know, and we just have just been letting them sit there for so long. So I really love that, uh, you know, we're really leaning on our community governments, really leaning more into utilizing that and, and especially in terms of Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And how cool would it be to be able to have these – areas to put in at the Malala and float down. You know, it, it's not just for bikes right. and pedestrians water, and yeah. equestrians, but water too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is really looking at that. You're absolutely right. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Mindy, for taking time out to talk to us and tell us about a couple of the, of the things you and your team and the city is working on. Uh, we really appreciate your work, as I've said, and uh, I'm sure we'll be following up again as these things progress. Oh, thank you so much. I look forward to it. Thank you, Tyler. Canby Then is brought to you by Retro Revival. They are not your average antique shop. Open daily. Find them on the corner of Northwest 3rd and Grant in downtown Canby. For a high school pitcher hoping to get a chance at the big leagues, throwing a no-hitter is a good way to catch a scout's eye. But that wasn't good enough for Jay Bowler. He threw six. From the time he first stepped onto the pitcher's mound at what we now call Wayne Oliver Field, Bowler had his heart set on one thing, making it to the big leagues. The fastball is the most effective pitch in baseball. That's the first thing I look for in a pitcher, said Bill Harper, the Philadelphia Phillies scout who scouted Bowler at Camby High. In professional baseball, if you can throw hard, you can make it. Bowler could throw hard. In high school, his fastball was clocked at 90 miles per hour, and a few years later, he'd be up to 95. This was at a time when the average major league heater was 86. A cannon for an arm wasn't Bowler's only physical gift. He was also unusually tall at six foot six. At Canby High, he had also been a star on the varsity basketball team. His size helped him get extra velocity on his fastball, 
In much the same way, Hall of Famer Randy the Big Unit Johnson's six foot ten frame enabled him to throw in excess of a hundred miles per hour. He is big, strong, and has some meanness, a minor league baseball exec would later say. He has a chance to be a good power pitcher with his fastball and a good hard slider. The Phillies, led enthusiastically by Harper, took Bowler with their third pick in the 1979 Major League Baseball draft, 98th overall. He started at Rookie League Helena, moving to a single-A Spartanburg for 1980. Bowler played well in the Phillies' farm system, even earning himself a spring training camp invite in 1981 after leading his league in strikeouts in double-A ball. But he didn't make it to the big club until the following year, and not until after Phillies' management took an unusual approach to his development. They moved him to the bullpen. Bowler had always been a starting pitcher, but the Philadelphia bullpen desperately needed help, and the front office said becoming a reliever would be his fastest ticket to the major leagues. It worked. He made his major league debut with the Phillies as a reliever on September 19, 1982, throwing a scoreless, hitless inning against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Bowler got into four games for the Phillies that September, starting one and relieving in three. He gave up three earned runs in seven innings of work. Bowler, though, didn't return to the majors until 1985. He also didn't return to Philadelphia for a decade. He was traded from the Phillies in 1983 to the Indians in the famous five-for-one deal that sent all-star Von Hayes the other way. Bowler spent 1983 and 1984 between double-A and triple-A with the Indians. In 1985, he was traded to the Cubs in a two-player deal. It was with the Cubs that Bowler would have his longest stint in the majors. He returned in August, getting into 20 games on the year. In September 1985, Bowler went 3.1 innings against the Cardinals in relief without giving up a run. Bowler returned to the Cubs for 36 outings in 1986, all in relief. In 1987, it was 23 relief outings. Then came a mysterious episode, one that would cast a dark cloud over what remained of Bowler's professional career. While out shopping for Christmas in Reading, Pennsylvania, Bowler collapsed. He was hospitalized with a 107-degree fever and spent three days in a coma. To say he almost died would be an understatement. His heart literally stopped twice. The episode was quietly but widely believed to have been a drug overdose, and Bowler's reputation as a free spirit and an enigma didn't help. Bowler walked out of the hospital after two weeks, and he would later even tell the Chicago Tribune that he understands people who thought he'd OD'd, but he maintained that's not what happened. I didn't do drugs, he told the paper in 1988. It was some kind of toxic poisoning I picked up from something I ate or drank or absorbed through my skin or something. He said his doctors tested him for everything under the sun, and they found toxic poison damage to his liver and kidney. There's a lot of things that were unanswered, he said. Some questions don't get answered. Whatever the reason for the episode, Bowler would never be the same. Though he would bounce back and forth between the majors and minors over the next five years, spending time with the Cubs and Royals before returning to Philly. He would compile 117 strikeouts over 156 innings pitched with six saves, but never stuck in a big league bullpen for a full season. But the big leagues weren't everything. During winter ball, he would play professionally in Venezuela, where he earned three Closer of the Year awards while setting an all-time record with 56 saves that still remains intact. Today, Bowler lives in Pennsylvania with his wife and four children. On Thursday, we'll continue our look at Camby's sports heroes 
as we bring you our long-awaited profile of a rodeo cowboy. That's next time on Canby Then. So I'm here with Derek Hill, president of Advantage Mortgage in Canby. I was wondering what's going on in the mortgage industry right now. The mortgage industry is on fire right now. The big thing that's really exciting for us is that we are now an independent mortgage broker, which means that we can offer substantially lower rates and lower fees for our customer. For example, we just got a loan last week and the realtor said, hey, I think you should go talk to Derek at Advantage Mortgage. And sure enough, we got the borrower three quarters better rate and we saved them 14 grand in fees. Cool, so where, where can people find you? So office number is 503-266-5800 or they can find us on the web at findtheadvantage.com. But most people just give us a holler or they stop in. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, bet. Advantage Mortgage, NMLS number 1770599. Derek Hills, NMLS number 50183. Equal housing opportunity. The Canby Now podcast is a production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned, full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe, and we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. The Canby Now podcast is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. Huge thank you as well to our supporters on Patreon. We rely on your monthly contributions to continue to do this work that we seriously love. For information on how you can become one of the coolest people in the world, a patron of the Canby Now podcast, visit canbynowpod.com backslash plus.